The Democracy That Delivers podcast is brought to you today by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SITE. This is the podcast where we talk about corruption in its many forms. And now to your host. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to SITE's podcast, Democracy Then Delivers. I will be your host today. My name is Ekaterina Lisova. I'm a senior program officer at SIPE, and I'm managing business integrity and anti-corruption compliance programming for Eastern uh, Europe and Central Asia and Caucasus, basically anything which relates to Europe and the Eurasia region. Today, we will be speaking about a very important topic. We will be talking about uh, some very specific efforts to address issues of strategic corruption, large-scale corruption. And if you know, the globally today uh, has been a lot of interest, a lot of awareness about the damage to democracy and civil society development and private sector operations uh, from the transnational corruption. Transnational corruption uh, basically includes anything from kleptocracy and state capture, strategic corruption, and means that the funds being moved across the countries. Today, we'll be speaking about the committee that was established last year in June 2021 by presidential degree in Moldova and is called the Independent Anti-Corruption Advisory Committee. It's a joint independent in international and national body and with the main purpose to analyze systemic corruption issues that cut across Moldovan institutions and improve implementation of anti-corruption measures by the relevant parties. The mission of, the, of this committee is also very important, is to strengthen Moldova's understanding of general and specific issues with respect to large-scale corruption and enhance its capacity to take appropriate action for greater impact on the life of the citizens of the Republic of Moldova. And today we have a pleasure to speak with two co-chairs of this committee, with James Wasserstrom and Tamara Rosen. I would like to introduce uh, quickly both, uh, both guests. Uh, Jim is uh, as a co-chair of this committee, uh, is a long-time anti-corruption expert and activist. He led the fight against corruption in public utilities for four years as senior staff at the UN administration mission in Kosovo, five years in Afghanistan as the US embassy's sole advisor on anti-corruption, three years in Ukraine as founder and co-chair of an anti-corruption commission. And currently, as the CCIA, which is the Moldovan abbreviation for the Independent the Corruption Advisory Committee in Moldova. Jim is also a whistleblower, having uncovered alleged criminality inside the UN and Kosovo and its concealment by UN headquarters in New York. Retaliation by the UN led to his termination. And the second guest today is Tamara Razin. Tamara is an expert in macroeconomics and international finance. During 14 years at the International Monetary Fund, IMF, she contributed to various projects and external section statistics, including authoring several working papers, drafting manuals, and uh, compiling guides. She also conducted multiple technical assistance missions to countries across uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, Middle East, and uh, authored the new architecture of IMF training. Previously, Tamara worked at the National Bank of Moldova, where she oversaw the development of the Moldovan banking sector. Welcome both, Jim and Tamara. And my first question would be to you is, um, how did it all come about? Tell us the story behind this committee. We would like to see whether it's, to what extent it's unique, whether there has been any examples of such efforts before. And so what are your roles in this committee? Jim, would you like to start, please? Sure, thank you, Katya. And thank you for that lovely introduction. Initially, the president of Moldova had sent out a call for help, essentially, uh, through SIPE initially to, to, to avoid what she felt was the progress of oligarchs in capturing the state, particularly the economy. And uh, so a colleague and I were brought in to have, try to come up with solutions to this really serious problem. And so we proposed the the establishment of this kind of commission, which is the third or fourth version of this. It originated in Afghanistan in an environment which was extremely toxic to fighting corruption. And then in Ukraine, also an environment which was extremely toxic. And initial attempt in, in Tunisia, which unfortunately died because of COVID, 
But uh, then to to import the idea to Moldova, where for the first time such a commission would be working with uh, with the a president and ultimately with the government that was reformist, that was actually interested seriously in in fighting corruption. So we proposed the committee. It was set up. We were then asked to help with the, the terms of reference and so on, and uh, ultimately joined it with three international members and three eminent Moldovan citizens. So we began our real work, I would say, in about November of 2021. Excellent. Excellent. And so maybe, uh, Tamara, you can tell us uh, about what are the main functions of this committee? How does it operate? Uh, well, thank you, Katya. And thank you for inviting to this interesting discussion. So uh, as uh, stated in our how to say, statute, our main uh, functions, the functions of the committee are to cover specific topics which are cho- choose by us, where we consider the corruption is uh, at the ext- extreme level and uh, to analyze existing facts, existing documents, existing developments, and to make our own conclusions on uh, what happened and how it was possible to happen those uh, corruption schemes, and to come to recommendations to related to bodies which were directly or indirectly related to, to those in- events. So uh, the committee is uh, having the our sessions once a quarter, and we are uh, deciding on the work plan of of the committee. So the first uh, report, which was uh, uh, was realized, actually it was launched in in, uh, July this year, it was the corruption in banking sector. The choose of this report, the the first one, was, I think, because this was such a painful topic in our society, which lasted already for eight years, where every single citizen actually was directly or indirectly affected by it. And no many actions have been undertaken by, by that point in time. So the society, I think, was expecting something specifically on this. And we were... It was a, one of the most difficult topics, but we were glad to, to start working on it. And it was a really uh, difficult difficult work, which took about 10 months, uh, but which ended with a report that was launched in July. Thank you, Tamara, for bringing up the report. And I would like to uh, mention to all our uh, listeners that the report that Tamara is talking about, it's called the Offshore Republic. It was published in July this year. And its title is a review of factors leading to systemic fraud and money laundering in Moldova's banking, financial, and insurance sector. And what struck me when I was reading it is right in the beginning when you described that the that the uh, this uh, report is the result of excruciating, exhaustive, and comprehensive research. Can you tell us more, Jim, maybe what was so excruciating about, about doing this research? I think it was excruciating because we're, we had to go back over nearly three decades of, of conflicting reports and conflicting stories as to the origin story of the, of the problem. It began really very soon after Moldova's independence, so early in the early 90s. And uh, so there's there are a lot of different opinions as to how it began and where it began, who was responsible, who wasn't responsible. And our function is to use evidence. We are an evidence based inquiry. We have no investigative powers whatsoever. It is a it is only to to establish the facts around a given situation. So over the very complicated period, especially from 94, 90, or the early 90s, early to mid-90s, um, until the collapse of the Moldovan banking sector in 2014, by 2014, it was happening in slow motion during the entire period. That was, it's very difficult to disentangle fact from fiction, opinions and anecdotes from reality, and to really try to figure out wh- wh- what happened and who was responsible. And then for the period after 2014, after the collapse, the fact that almost nothing happened in terms of correction until the last year or so was also 
uh, quite difficult to get straight. So we had to rely on on registries, original primary sources, not secondaries, um, it, unless we had to. But interviews, documents from the period in question, original sources, both in Romanian and well, Romanian and if possible in English. So it was a it was a, a tr- truly laborious and very intense task. And of course, we interviewed more than 50 people, including some of the alleged perpetrators of these crimes. So, uh, so it was exhaustive as well as excruciating. And to what extent are you satisfied with the with the results of? I mean, with the, in terms of getting access to information that you needed to uh, uncover some of those things again uh, that took place, you know, 30 years ago and in the last 30 years. So that basically the the status of the committee that was established by the presidential decree has it helped in your research to conduct and have access to information that you needed for your research? Yes, actually, this was the first time where we didn't have to fight uh, for access to documents. In the other cases, we did fight, but we managed to achieve it in those instances as well. But in this case, it was relatively easy because we were given uh, permission because of the presidential nature of this of the decree, we were given uh, permission to look at uh, government sources. One of our staff actually was given that authority, who was on the on the drafting team, and so uh, so that with so in addition to this massive uh, research across the world, because of course we were tracking money laundering and the, the thousands of shell companies that were established mainly in the United Kingdom, that uh, that where the money was was moving in various times and in other parts of the world. Fortunately, as much of this is online now, it makes it a bit easier. But uh, for the documents themselves from inside government during the period in question, we were granted, one of our members was granted access to that uh, on condition that he didn't uh, disclose it directly to others. I see. And I just would like to remind to all our listeners that we're speaking about the report that was produced by the Independent Anti-Corruption Advisory Committee in Moldova, or CCIA in its Moldova abbreviation, in July this year, and it's called the Offshore Republic. The report is available on the CCIA's website in English, Romanian, and Russian. Uh, and so my question, my next question is that if you look at this report, it has a number of very specific recommendations. Yeah, more than 40 recommendations from strengthening institutional capacity, increasing transparency of institution, changing legislation, improving oversight mechanism in the financial banking insurance sectors, ensuring transparent procedures, clear criteria for appointment of governor, deputy governor at the National Bank of Moldova, and other very, very specific things. So given that it was in July, I wanted to ask you, maybe Tamara, you can ask, uh, answer this question. Uh, what has been the reaction from those who those recommendations were addressed and also from the general public? Yes, we have the report includes a, quite a big number of recommendations very oriented to the uh, involved bodies and the action from the authorities uh, was, uh, I can say, positive. Um, mostly all of them reacted uh, with uh, engagement that will take uh, in actions to will start working uh, on that. It was uh, very, we were very pleased uh, with the direction of the parliament. So based on our recommendations, because a lot of recommendations are specifically linked to the review or of the legislation to make some adjustments to the legislation to enforce some uh, uh, regulatory acts. Uh, so the parliament created a special working group that uh, is uh, following our recommendation. They working on the to review uh, the existing uh, reg- the legal acts to try to make uh, changes uh, to avoid in the future the, to eliminate possibility of repeating uh, such uh, uh, schemes in the financial sector. Also, uh, the secretariat met with uh, almost with all uh, authorities involved and started collecting from them information on. Uh, what steps started being taken? It's it's true. It's only three months uh, left where after the launch of the report, 
a few uh, actions have the deadline three months, and those are specifically scrutinized because there should be uh, some actions already started on that. I mean, some of them have six months, and uh, the biggest part is I think it's uh, up to one year. The, we plan to uh, elaborate every six months reports of the committee that will be a follow-up of the uh, actions based on our recommendations. And these reports uh, will be based on the inputs from the bodies which are targeted and uh, it will be not just based on their reports, but uh, they will also conduct an assessment of uh, reliability of those those facts that are indicated in the reports. And these reports will be made public to inform the society that actually the committee is not just uh, wrote a report, but it's, it's following up to see the, the actions to implement it. The first such report will be in... Uh, in February, the beginning of February, after six months of, uh, of uh, the launch of the report. And to what extent these recommendations are mandated to be implemented by those target institutions that you mentioned in the report? Do they have to? To what extent they have to do that? And if they don't, uh, what will happen after that? What's basically, what's the accountability system here? Because because the committee has full support of the, of the government, existing government, even if we are just an independent committee, we don't have any legal power, we are just like a, like a consultant body, the institutions that uh, were involved in this, they are taking it pretty serious. And uh, they are understanding that, uh, because we made it clearly, that we will not keep our, we will keep uh, loudly, we will speak loudly about if they are doing or not something, if they are taking, uh, taking steps. And we will do our best to, to make it, to bring it to the public, to bring it to as ass assessment of the society, to see if those uh, bodies really are engaged in fighting the corruption. Okay. And so far, what has been the reaction from the general public, from the media, from the civil society organizations, and so on? What we can say, definitely, it was a very, very big interest in, in this report. From the very moment of its launch, we had a lot of media uh, queries. Uh, we had a lot. Uh, we, we were a lot of uh, reaction from the society. Also, people were writing, asking, and people expecting something, some results from this from this report. For the first time, they were able to uh, read in in the in the understandable way what actually happened. What what were those schemes that were implemented? They were actually uh, under the need of the of the financial sector that brought these three big, big uh, corruption events. And uh, we, for the first time, we make a link between three, three of them and uh, the society, the people could, were able to, to see it and to understand what has happened. And uh, uh, even now, just recently, we launched the, the Russian version of the report. We finally have its translation. Again, we saw a lot of interest on, from the side of media. And uh, we, we saw that uh, you know, our Russian-speaking colleagues and so very interested in the subject. And uh, it's, 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 it, it reached the citizens, simple citizens. This is, I think, it's the best, best achievement of our report. I think also, Katya, let me, if I, if, you, if I may add to, uh, to what, uh, what Tamara has said, the report makes a point of naming names. Uh, we don't speak anonymously. Uh, that's not our purpose is to, we actually tr do try to, to highlight. And I think that people were surprised at some of the names that they hadn't heard before. So, and that keeps coming back to us. Oh, I had no idea that so and so we played such an important role in this first time I've ever seen this before. This of course is not, has been, been quite embarrassing for people who have who've been happily remaining in the shadows for 20 years. But unfortunately, some of these people are current members of parliament or representatives of, of, uh, of the party of the fugitive entrepreneur uh, that's named in the report. So the, one of the points that we make is that some of the decision making here is in the hands of the Moldovan people. Why would you continue to reelect to your parliament people you know played an, a, an, an extremely important role in undermining your entire economy and your political system? 
Right. So I think that the fact that you're naming the name, that was actually my uh, my next question about that, that it's, it's very, again, striking when you see that, the specific names uh, uh, listed in the report with a very detailed description of various schemes that were used to to hide that the movement of funds and so on. And so my question here is, um, we call this oligarchs, right? It's a, it's a common term applied to these people. And many countries in the post-Soviet space uh, and, and beyond are trying to find this um, effective de-oligarchization measures. So to what extent this report and your findings can contribute to these efforts and maybe support some legislative, regulatory attempts to curb oligarchization in countries such as Armenia and Georgia and uh, Ukraine and so on? I think it's directly relevant and applicable, and I can see how, how it would be, how, how it, it could be done in exactly those countries. The, there is, I mean, the whole point that for, behind the committee is, is to extirpate oligarchs. That's what we're trying to do. So, uh, or at least to minimize their influence, or re- re- make them, make them retract. So, so that is likely to happen here. In fact, uh, over the next period of time, I won't say how long. And the, one of the key criteria, of course, has been a, a very cooperative government. Uh, I think to your one of your original questions is how how possible is this? Uh, how replicable is it? I think it's it's rep, it works best in places in in highly toxic environments like this one when it comes to corruption where people are really fed up and there is a popular mood against it, which can be expressed through the political process, through a reformist government, or can be expressed uh, in the case of Ukraine with a very, very vibrant civil society that uh, that demands that the change take place. And so a committee like this can be responsive either to the civil society uh, concern, which then helps to, helps to, um, channel the energy in ways that are actionable very specifically and puts pressure on government to create, give access to committee members and then to take these recommendations seriously because the alternative is defeat at the next election or uh, riots in the streets if they're not holding elections and this and the alternative uh, is that governments that are that are uh, that are trying to address these concerns who are, who are pro reform can probably achieve it more readily when they have an, an external body completely independent. We receive no political support from the government. We set our own agenda. We are totally independently financed. There's no connection between us and the government. I want to make that absolutely clear. This is not a government organization of any kind. So, so uh, we then will produce these reports and with recommendations as Tamara has, has so eloquently stated that after six months, we will be issuing this report card that it's coming out uh, for the first report in February, we hope March, where the government will, will answer to us. And if they don't answer, we will report that they haven't answered, but in this case, they are likely to answer in the, in the main. And we will check. We will actually verify what we're told. It's not just an exchange of, of letters. Uh, they say that they have they have uh, improved their registry of beneficial ownership. Well, we're going to see what that whether that's true, and if it isn't, we'll say this is what they say, but this is what we found, and uh, so that will build build pressure for continued reform, and this will continue every six months for each one of our reports until we're satisfied that the that they've achieved the level of of a correction that we have we have uh, recommended. This is where the first part is the report. The second part is to make sure something is done. And so for our, future, our next reports, which are imminent, well, the same process will occur. Uh, actually, yeah. So before moving, uh, moving on to the next steps and what should we expect from the committee in the next, in the coming months. So I wanted to ask you a question, something that you emphasize here and some, something I think is of essence for anyone who listens to us is that what makes this committee independent 
and really so effective in tackling a very sensitive and potentially, again, very dangerous activity of uncovering the instances of systemic large-scale corruption. So maybe you can talk just in, in, within just a very short period of time, like what is the composition of the committee that makes it independent and, uh, you know, expertise? Well, I think that, uh, that for, the, for, the, for the nationals that participate, uh, in general, they're already involved in civil society in some prominent way. So they're used to being um, sort of leaders and uh, to some extent fearless. Uh, and uh, so they, so, so, and, and outspoken. We've been, we were, we've been very lucky to have, uh, have an, in, they have expertise in a variety of subject matters, which are not necessarily an anti-corruption. So like, for example, uh, Tamara's expertise is exactly in finance and, and banking and was instrumental, as she mentioned, in the in the establishing the, the Moldovan banking sector. So what better person to have as uh, as the mentor with me for the this first report on the tragedy of that of the failure of that system? Then on the international side, we've gone in this in this instance, we've gone a bit heavy on the anti-corruption expertise, uh, but from different perspectives, what more technocratic, more political, etc. So some more civil society focused. So there's a, there's a, a, a broad range of skills and the internationals, of course, are non-residents. So they're under less threat, uh, presumably than, uh, than the nationals might be. In this case, so far, there has been little of that, but, uh, but it, it takes really not being afraid to, to say it the way you see it. And so in the remaining minute, I would like to ask you, and maybe Tamara, you can tell us about w what's coming for the committee, what type of work you are, aside from this, the, the reports on the implementation of the recommendations of this, the first report, the Offshore Republic, what else are you planning to do? What, what topics are you covering? Yeah, they have really interesting uh, plans. Our second report is almost ready to be launched. It will be launched next week on 28th of uh, November. And it will be on ar architecture of the anti-corruption uh, institutions in the country. Currently in Moldova, there are about nine institutions which are expected to, to fight the corruption. And uh, unfortunately, none of them prove to be efficient. And they have what they have at this stage. So uh, this is a very interesting review of uh, those institutions, their functions, what uh, made them, uh, what was on the basis of uh, efficiency and what uh, uh, should be done to make them efficient, which could be the recommended, from our point of view, uh, new structures, new, new distribution of responsibilities between them. So it comes on 28th of November. Again, from the beginning, we will have a Romanian and English version, but Russian will definitely will come in one month and, and so and the next uh, said report, which is already the work started, it's on uh, financing of political parties and elections. So this report is expected to be uh, somehow in, the, in spring, in the first half of the year. And the first report, uh, which and our two other four colleagues are mentoring those two reports, and the first one, which you, it's it's still far away, but we are thinking already, have some ideas. And again, Jim and I will be uh, mentoring. It's uh, on state-owned enterprises, corruption in the state-owned enterprises. Another very, very painful subject and uh, a subject away from where millions and millions of funds are withdrawn from, from the budget, from the society. So these are our, let's say, one-year plans until the end of next year. Katya, can I... Can I can I add, add one tiny point? Sure. We're quite proud of the fact that uh, uh, in the new USAID decleptification guide, we are uh, given, uh, we're highlighted as a, as a good example of, of, of what might be done in certain circumstances. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thank you so much, Jim. 
for your answers, for your efforts to tackle such a critical issue for uh, democracy, for our democracy, for democracy around the world, uh, such as uh, large-scale corruption, uh, state capture, kleptocracy, oligarchy capture of economies and political life, right, in, in countries. So I encourage uh, all our listeners of, of the CYPES podcast, Democracy That Delivers, to read this report, this report, the Offshore Republic, is the report that is published on the CCIA website uh, and accessible in three languages, in English, Russian, and Romanian. And also uh, watch out for those three reports that are coming up. And the one is on the architecture of the anti-corruption institutions in Moldova. Uh, another one, the financing of political parties and elections, extremely important issue, and the corruption is uh, in state-owned enterprises. All three are very, very sharp, highly debated, highly discussed around the world issues. We will be definitely uh, watching and uh, looking forward to reading those reports, learning from them. Thank you so much again for being with us, and thank you to all listeners of uh, SAP's podcast, Deli Democracy That Delivers. Thank you and goodbye. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.